Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and welcome to worship with Newcastle Presbyterian Church on this January morning. As we gather this day for folks in person, you're invited, if you're visiting with us, to fill out one of our visitor cards in the pews. If you're worshiping with us and have a prayer request to lift up, either a thanksgiving or a concern, you're also invited to use the prayer request cards in the pews. Both of those cards can be handed to an usher during our offering time that we might better connect and support you through our worship today. For folks who are tuning in at home, we hope you will go to our website, newcastlepresschurch.org. There you can learn more about the ministry and mission of our congregation, as well as find today's bulletin that you might sing and pray along with us. During today's service, we will be commissioning Amy Selheimer and Candy Dunson to go and serve as part of our Presbytery's Guatemalan delegation. So you, you're invited to go ahead um, to the link in the bulletin to follow along with their blog. Uh, through, that, um, through the website, you can sign up to receive daily updates, or you can just simply save the link in your browser that you might keep up with their journals. Um, but especially keep them in your prayers as they head off on Tuesday. This is the week. As Amy and Candy head to Guatemala, they have the opportunity to share a photo of our congregation with our Guatemalan partners. For those of you who participated in the past with our prayer partners, this is kind of an updated version where instead of doing individual um, picture exchanges, we'll be just exchanging pictures of our congregation. So it's picture day. We're going to be gathering in the central pews at, right at the end of worship. During the postlude, I'll invite you to come and gather. We'll smile up at the balcony, take a quick snap, and then head on over to coffee hour. So again, get your smiles ready now. <laughs> Next Sunday, it's a fifth Sunday coffee hour. Um, we'll be doing something a little unique. Congregational Life will be inviting us to have a crockpot competition. All are invited to bring a crockpot of your favorite soup, stew. You can bring a chili if you want. I know we did the chili cook-off in the fall, but you can bring chili back this time. Um, but af at the end of our coffee hour, we'll gather with Sharon Moore to do part two of our storytelling series. This time, instead of hearing Sharon tell stories, she'll be inviting us to start telling our own. So we hope that you'll gather with us for suits and stay for story time next Sunday. There are a few mission opportunities included in the bulletin. Um, Fee Price actually has already found a volunteer for February for Epiphany House. But if you're interested in signing up for an Epiphany House dinner this spring, the sign-up sheet is over in the fellowship hall. Take a moment to check out the dates there during coffee hour. Additionally, the LGBTQIA plus task force is still calling for a couple more members. So please let Diana Riley know today, if possible, if you're interested in being a part of our welcoming effort. And Undies Sunday is back. February 12th, we'll be collecting underwear and socks and robes and any other new, um, new clothing that you might want to donate to Friendship House's clothing bank. Um, so you can go ahead and start dropping off items to the box in the entryway in the CE building, or feel free to bring all your best new underwear on Sunday, February 12th, again, as we celebrate the way that God's grace supports us in many ways. Let us begin our worship together with a reminder of Christ's peace. As Jesus greeted his disciples, so let us greet one another. The peace of Christ be with you, and also with you. Please stand as you are able, and let us extend a sign of Christ's welcome to one another. <laughs> Thank you. 
please join me in the call to worship. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? As we behold the beauty of God's temple, we see God's face. God is our shelter and our shade. Let us sing to the God of our salvation. Please be seated. Our holy God sees our hearts and knows us better than we know ourselves. And our holy God seeks our confession of what we have done, of who we have failed to be, so that God can meet us with mercy. So let us pray together. God of mercy, you call us to fish for people, but we are hesitant to leave our boats. We are afraid to let go of the things we hoard, believing they make us secure. We are afraid to put our trust in you, afraid to follow, afraid we will fail. Forgive us. Transform our fear into faithfulness and enable us to walk with you that we may be part of your work in the world. Amen. 
The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. We give thanks this day that God gets angry at wrongdoing. In Christ, we see God's fury at those who profit from wrongdoing, who benefit from injustice. Christ flips tables to emphasize that his call to faith means making dramatic change. Yet even in his righteous anger, Christ extends grace and peace, welcoming sinners to dine with him, healing the brokenhearted, standing between the mob and those accused. The Lord is slow to anger and quick to forgive. In confidence, we can trust God to push us from complacency, giving us righteous anger at wrongdoing, while also calling us to follow him in the path of reconcil reconciliation and peace. Let us proclaim the good news together. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Grateful that God has not stopped speaking to us, let us pray now that God's Spirit would open us to hear God's Word and to live it out. Let us pray. Speak to us, living God, as you have spoken to our ancestors. Through the voices of your prophets, the breath of your spirit, and the life of your Son, so that we may live according to your word. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. We continue our four-part series through the book of Jonah, and we continue to crack open our pew Bible. So at this point, I invite you to find a pew Bible near you. Once again, we're delving into the minor prophets in the Old Testament. If you need a reminder of the song, it goes, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum. Okay, so you can find Jonah between Obadiah and Micah, or you can just turn to page 860, and we begin our reading from the third chapter. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, get up. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, no human or animal, no herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Humans and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change that law. God may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For our scripture conversation today, I invite our youngest members to meet me around the communion table. Is Luke coming down? (laughs) Luke, you can bring your shaker with you. Come on down. (laughs) Hello, greetings. Greetings, greetings. Hello, Avery Monroe, Ryan. Good morning. All right, so today we're going to be talking about second and third and fourth chances. Raise your hand, and this is for everyone. Raise your hand if you've ever been given another chance. Raise your hand. So especially if you think back to your school days or your current school days, when you've gotten a bad grade on a test, but your teacher says, don't worry, you can do extra credit. What does that feel like when you get another chance? Can you act it out for me? Is it like, yes? Is it like, okay, you're like, thanks. How do you act when you're given another chance? You think? Okay, one of my favorite examples of second chances. Have you ever played Mario Kart? Have you ever been in last place, and on the final lap, you get the magic box that gives you the extra speed? Have you ever had that? That has happened to me multiple times, because I'm not that good at Mario Kart. The twist is, when you get that magic, I think it's a magic bullet, sometimes you can even win. You can go from last place to first place on the last lap. Now, how does that feel? It's like, yes, it's amazing. Yeah. 
Yeah, and you get that extra boost. Yes. What does that feel like? Amazing. Yeah. So in today's story, we hear about not just Nona, Jonah getting a second chance, but also the whole city of Nineveh. Nineveh was not a very nice place to live. Scripture talks about it being a really mean place, a place where people would hurt each other, no one got along, nobody was helping one another. But Nineveh got a chance to change, to try again, to commit to living in love with one another. And God doesn't just give Jonah a second chance in our story. God gives all the people in Nineveh. Jonah's story reminds us that throughout our lives, we are given second, third, fourth, many chances to keep trying again. And God reminds us that even when we've hurt others or been hurt ourselves, that God is calling us to God's way of love and of peace to giving one another second chances. So today we get to rejoice, to rejoice with the people of Nineveh that they've been given another chance because we know what that feels like. We know how incredible that is. And through it all, through Jonah's story, remind, God reminds us of God's love. So let us remind one another this day. Can you repeat after me? Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, and Jesus loves you, and Jesus loves you. Yeah. Because it's so incredible. Well, go in peace to Sunday school, and thank you all so much. Thank you, Luke. You want to follow them? Perfect. As Ryan said, second chances, they're so incredible that you can only describe them in the moment, and it's hard to remember after what they felt like. So let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A formative part of my education happened at Union Presbyterian Seminary in Richmond, Virginia. My seminary offered travel seminars to students. Often during the shortened January or May terms, we were given opportunities to travel as a group to different places around the world where the Presbyterian Church USA had church partnerships happening. Besides getting to go on a travel seminar to the Middle East, I was blessed to also travel to Guatemala. While I was there, I learned from Guatemalan pastors and community leaders, as well as our Peace USA mission coworkers there, about the incredible work happening in the country. Now, the themes of these travel seminars usually revolved around the church in the world. They invited us seminary students to ask, how and where is God already at work in the world, bringing reconciliation, peace, and good news to our neighbors in need. As to be pastors, we were encouraged to take what we learned and ask the same questions back in our home communities and our home congregations about where God was already at work right here at home. During my time in Guatemala, I was particularly struck by the persevering spirit and strength of faithful Christians there. In the midst of great financial corruption, after decades of governmental disappearances where hundreds and thousands of loved ones were literally disappeared from their homes by the military force, and during, after years of so many folks struggling with um, broader climate change challenges as well as political corruptions, there were still so many good and faithful people committed to a different way forward. Folks committed to a future of sustainable agriculture. Folks committed to the preservation and celebration of indigenous cultures. Folks who were actively planting seeds of hope for future generations. The figurative mountain climb towards justice is steep 
in Guatemala, as steep as the mountainous highlands are in the western part of the country. But during my time there, it was inspiring to see the Holy Spirit on the move, especially through our existing Guatemalan partnership. Amy and Candy will have the opportunity this week to go and see firsthand the beauty of Guatemalan's natural environment, the amazing and welcoming culture there, and they'll also get to see our partnership at work, not just through chickens, but through education and the empowerment of men and women. And while they'll get to see it firsthand, we get to travel along with them. Through their eyes, their hands, and their feet, through the travel blog, through the stories they'll share upon their return, we'll get to join in with them, asking, how is God already at work amongst our Guatemalan neighbors? And how is God also faithfully at work amongst us here in Newcastle? Now, Amy and Candy, we are so grateful that you answered the call to Guatemala with a resounding yes. Unlike the prophet Jonah, your stories do not involve running away, repeatedly resisting God's repetition of call. You didn't have to be asked twice, so hallelujah to that. But Jonah's story reminds us that God is already on the move in places outside of our normal spheres. And sometimes our call to discipleship begins with the simple, faithful act of showing up, of leaving behind what we've known and being willing to go to witness something miraculous. In Jonah's case, it takes two very eventful chapters in his story before he finally makes it to his intended destination, Nineveh. Now, a note on our story. Up to this point, there has already been a lot of hyperbole, a lot of exaggerated details in our story. If you remember back to chapter one, we begin with the great storm, <clears throat> the greatest storm that threatens to pull the ship apart, leaving experienced sailors even terrified and panic, panicked, so great. And then in chapter two, there's the great fish, so large that it can hold Jonah in its belly for three days and three nights. In chapter three, our trend of greats continues. We come to the great city of Nineveh, a city that is so large that it takes three days to walk across it. Now, according to historical records and archeological finds, Nineveh actually wouldn't have been that large of a city during Jonah's lifetime. Around 785 BCE, it would have been a smaller town that continued to grow over the century. But in line with our great fish tale, Nineveh is massive, massive in its size and also extensive in its evilness. I think of the Star, Wo Star Wars quote from the first film, if you can remember Obi-Wan Kenobi standing with Anakin Skywalker looking, not Anakin Skywalker, with Luke Skywalker looking down on Mos Eisley, Obi-Wan turns to him and says, you will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. Nineveh, behold the great city. It is vast in its size, vast in its evilness, but God sends Jonah there anyway. Now, so far in our story, we've seen God's grace and mercy for Jonah, rescuing him from the depths and giving him chance after chance to prophesy, to make it to Nineveh. And now we arrive at the climax of the story. What will happen to Nineveh? We get to see God at work in the world there because it's definitely not Jonah who saves the city of Nineveh reluctant prophet has made it, but he really doesn't put in the effort. He goes on one day's walk into the city, as in he goes a third of the way into the city, not even to the city center, before he kind of just gives up and starts to prophesy. And his prophecy is limited even in its effort. It's eight words long in English, 
only five words in Hebrew, and he simply states, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Jonah doesn't give any context to his prophecy. He doesn't extrapolate on what the people can do. He doesn't even mention God. Now, God had told Jonah to proclaim God's given message to him. We have to pause and ponder at this point. Were those eight words God's intended message? Was that the miracle that out of nothing God could bring about repentance and redemption? Or perhaps it's an example of even with our worst efforts, God can still move in and through us. Because either way, somehow miraculously, God's message is still heard. God's word sticks with the people. The people of Nineveh believe God. They proclaim a fast, and everyone, great and small, humans and animals, put on sackcloth, signs of mourning and repentance. And the king himself gets involved, issuing a decree. And our unnamed king does not presume that their collective actions will make a difference. But he asks the honest, hopeful question, who knows? Who knows? God may still relent and change God's mind. The Lord is slow to anger. We've been building up our statement that God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger. And next week we'll complete it and hear Jonah himself proclaim it in chapter 4. But today we sit with this truth that God is slow to anger. An incredible shift happens in Nineveh. The people turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. It's a curious phrase within our scripture, the violence that is in their hands. It invites us to use our imaginations, not just of the physical violence, but the financial violence, the transactional violence, all of the ways that the people were hurting one another in Nineveh. And God extends incredible grace to its people. God is slow to anger, giving them more chances to live in goodness rather than evil. Nineveh is not just delivered from God's judgment, they are delivered from their own destructive ways. The people commit to a new way of living together. They commit to a life together that is oriented not towards violence, but towards peace and hope. Next week, as we wrap up our story work, we'll explore the greater context of Jonah's tale especially why it's so radical for God to be extending grace to people in Nineveh, part of the Assyrian Empire. But for today, Jonah's story invites us to sit with God's anger and first and foremost appreciate that God does get angry at injustice and wrongdoing, that God cares and calls up prophets and leaders to call us And as God is slow to anger, God gives second chances. God gives second chances to Jonah and to Nineveh. And we can hope that God gives second chances to people in the U.S., to people in Guatemala, that God cares about cities and villages and communities all around the world. In the midst of wrongdoing, in the midst of violence and of injustice, we can have hope that God is still calling everyday believers to seek change together. God is still calling reluctant prophets and willing partners. God is calling everyday disciples to believe, to respond, to repent, and to live new life together. From the coastlands to the mountains, from Guatemala to the U.S., from ancient Israel to ancient Assyria, we can trust that God is present wherever we go, providing us with second, third, and many chances throughout our lives. Candy and Amy, as y'all travel to Guatemala, we're grateful that we get to travel with you, witnessing along with you God at work in the world, in and through our Guatemalan partnership. 
May we all be asking together how God is at work here in Newcastle as well. And may we all be amazed by the incredible wonders of God's second, third, and multiple chances at grace at work in our world. Thanks be to God who is slow to anger, in whom we mo live and move and have our being. Amen. Amen. At this time, we will commission Amy and Candy on our behalf, so I invite them to come forward along with Clerk Scott Selheimer. Good morning. Good morning. A group from Newcastle Presbytery will travel to Guatemala from January 24th to the 31st to continue strengthening our partnership there. This is the largest contingent ever sent with 16 travelers representing eight churches. Two of the travelers are from Newcastle Presbyterian Church, Candy Dunson and Amy Selheimer. The group will travel to the Western Highlands to visit with the Association of Mom Christian Women for Development. Activities there will include a meeting with a board of directors in their new office space and visiting groups of women out in their communities to see their projects, the stoves, the greenhouses, the cows, and of course, the chickens. After spending a night of brief R&R &R at Lake Atitlan, they will then travel back to Guatemala City to spend a day at the Sedepka offices to meet the staff and learn more about the incredible work that partner organizations are doing. Along the way, the group will visit two new projects sponsored by PCUSA's Self-Development of People Grants, which are funded through our One Great Hour of Sharing offering. We ask for your prayers to keep them safe on the journey. You can follow along with them each day as they travel by, dis by subscribing to their blog via the link in our bulletin. Upon their return, you will have two opportunities to hear about their experience. On Thursday, March 23rd at 7 p.m., the travelers will be giving a creative and interactive presentation via Zoom to the entire presbytery. And on April 23rd, Candy and Amy will give a personal presentation here at NCPC. Stay tuned for more details about both events, and we hope you will attend. Today we commission Amy and Candy to go in peace to love and serve the Lord. We commission them to faithfully represent us to our Guatemalan partners and to go in Christ's name. So let us pray. Faithful God, in baptism you claimed us, and by your Holy Spirit you are working in our lives, empowering us to live a life worthy of our calling. We thank you for leading Amy and Candy to serve our Guatemalan partnership in this way. Guide them by your Holy Spirit, that in your service they may grow in faith, hope, and love, and be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. And let us pray together using the words in our bulletin. As, As your, your faithful, faithful people, people, we commit, commit ourselves to supporting Candy and Amy, and Amy with, with prayer and encouragement, and encouragement so that Christ's reign of peace, justice, justice and love will be known throughout the world until Christ comes. Let, Let your spirit move in your, in your whole church from, from the U.S. to Guatemala, Guatemala that, that all your children would rejoice together in your grace and in your mercy. Amen. Amen. Candy and Amy, go with God. Vaya con Dios. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Bless y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our giving is a sign of our trust in God's presence and purpose in our lives. Let us bear witness to that trust as we offer ourselves and our gifts to God.
Let us pray. Holy One, you meet us where we are and call us to step forth in faith. Claim us as disciples, strengthen us by your Spirit, and launch us to lives of faithfulness that through the gifts of our lives and offerings, we would proclaim your grace and mercy to all. In Christ our Savior, amen. You may be seated. As we gather for this time of prayer today, we particularly remember families who are mourning the death of loved ones, including the family of Kathy, niece of Lynn and Ray Snyder, who was buried yesterday. We remember the family of Mildred Lane, who was buried in our cemetery this past week. And we particularly remember the family of KJ, who recently passed away in Cleveland. We also remember folks in the midst of their physical recovery as they're receiving care, especially Monty Gerhardt as he continues to recover from a recent fall, and for Anita Johnson, who continues to receive physical therapy after a recent fall. And we continue especially to remember the littlest ones among us, including Sully, who is recovering from heart surgery, Amelia, who was born prematurely, and especially for folks ongoing in their cancer care, including Connie. Let us pray. Loving God, we are so grateful that you call us to see you, to experience your presence with us in our home communities and throughout your world. We thank you for the gift of community, for partnerships across national borders, and for connections that are made and strengthened in Christ's name. Oh God, we pray for the many ways that we are connected to one another. We pray for political systems and leaders, for wisdom in their discernment, and courage to act for peace and justice. We pray for families, especially those separated by circumstances or strife. We pray that you would heal the divisions among all the families of our world. We pray especially for our communities in the midst of this distanced and departed time when the distance between us seems greater than what connects us. We would ask that you would build bridges and enables, enable us to work together for the things which bring us closer to your beloved kingdom. As members of Christ's body, we pray that you would be present in the church throughout the world, that we would be a faithful witness together to the love and grace, the second, the third, the fourth chances that we know in Jesus Christ. Especially we pray for our neighbors who are suffering in mind, in body or spirit. We pray for all who are living in or displaced from homes, experiencing hunger, violence, and poverty. We pray especially this day for the sick, for all the amazing caregivers stepping into the void to try to bring healing and wholeness. We pray especially for our neighbors who are lonely, who are imprisoned, all who are struggling with addiction, all who are struggling with their mental health. Especially, oh God, we pray for all who have been abused, who are experiencing neglect, who are feeling outcast. We pray for all who are grieving, who are angry, and who are hopeless. We would ask that you would be present in our midst in the midst of our neighbors' lives, that you would bring your comfort, your consolation, and your transforming care. And especially this day, O oh God, we lift up to you the prayers that are closest to our hearts. We pray for Monty and Anita in their healing. We pray for all who grieve, including the families of KJ, of Kathy, of Mildred, of Ronald, and of Jean. Oh God, we remember folks who are striving for peace in our world, especially for leaders in Ukraine, especially for all the educators and students at William Penn who returned with courage to school this week. 
We pray, oh God, for folks with COVID, folks who are recovering from COVID in the midst of this ongoing pandemic. We remember that your love is also never ending and we rely on it this day as we care for one another. And oh God, especially we pray for traveling mercies for all in our Presbyteries delegation as they head to Guatemala on Tuesday. And oh God, especially this day, we pray for hope for all in the midst of their cancer care, including Connie and Tracy, Edward and Rajni, Kathy and Doug, Shirley and Pam. For loving God in the unknowns of this world, we ask, who knows? Who knows what will happen in our lives and in our world? Who knows if our actions make a difference? And yet, we trust and rely and depend on your goodness and on your mercy. Be slow to anger with us and give us more chances to turn from our paths of violence, from the ways that our hands work evil against one another, and begin to seek together your path of peace. Oh God, we lift all these prayers, both spoken and unspoken, and trust that your constant presence is with us even now, continuing to hear us as we pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
so let me repeat the directions. During our postlude today, everyone is invited to move to the central pews for a quick picture time. So again, get your smiles ready, and thank you for your cooperation. As we send Candy and Amy off to Guatemala to help us travel and learn more about our Guatemalan partnership, we remember that even as we pray for the women there, they are praying for us here. For Jonah reminds us that there is nowhere that we can run from God's grace and mercy. There is no city, no country, no place that's beyond God's grace. Even the great city of Nineveh, renowned for its evil ways, is still within the bounds of God's providential care. As we seek new ways of living together in Guatemala and in Newcastle, may we practice repentance together. May we commit to a future of peace together, all while trusting that God is present there and God is present here. As we go forth each on our own journey, May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit hold us all fast now and forevermore. Amen.